It's a, a pleasure to in introduce uh, Yang Li from MIT, uh, who will be discussing, oh, I thought you were going to talk about exotic Calabi metrics, but maybe you'll talk about non-compact ones. Okay. Exotic, well, I mean, it's the same title, really. Okay, it's a pleasure <laughs> to uh, speak at this Zoom seminar. So today I'm going to talk about non-compact exotic Calabi metrics. Um, so let me try to start with the basics. So what is a Calabi-R manifold? Well, it's a Kähler manifold with a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So if you're not exactly a geometer, so what sort of data is involved here? So first of all, you have a complex manifold X. So this omega is a symplectic form. It's also known as a Kähler form. Uh, so the Kähler condition is saying the complex structure and the symplectic structure are sort of compatible uh, so that you also have a Riemannian structure. So this capital omega stands for a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So if you have this, you can actually recover the complex structure. So this is the data which completely specifies the, the structure of a Kähler manifold. Um, so the Calab yau condition means the following. So you have a symplectic form, this omega. Uh, what you can do with that is, well, this N stands for the complex dimension of the manifold. So if you have this symplectic form, you can um, get a volume form by raising to the nth power. Uh, so another way you can get a volume form is by starting with this holomorphic volume form. Um, so if you have that, uh, which typically looks like something like dz1 wedge dz2 on, onto d, uh, dzn, uh, what you can do is you can wedge this thing by its complex conjugate. And then you will get a real 2n dimensional uh, form, which is a kind of top degree form it's up to a constant. You can make that into another volume form. Uh, so the Kabyal condition is the condition that these two are equal up to constants where the constant is determined cohomologically because you can always integrate the symplectic form to the nth power and that's, that's a topological number. So the main, the main motivation why people got interested in Calabian metrics, at least historically, uh, was that, well, I, I mentioned to you that once you have a symplectic form and a complex structure, you get a Riemannian structure. Uh, canonically. So you can consider the Ritzi curvature of that Riemannian uh, structure. And this uh, equation implies that the Ritzi curvature is equal to zero. So that's, that condition is quite famous. It's known as the Einstein equation uh, with zero, zero cosmological constant. So this is well, of course, everything is in the Euclidean signature, so perhaps not so physical as you might hope, but still that's the main reason people uh, first thought this was important. So later, there, there are many other sort of physical motivations coming from string theory, but these tend to get much more sophisticated. So for, for general purposes, this is a good way of um, motivating the problem. So the big theorem uh, on this subject is, of course, uh, the big theorem of Yao. Uh, so this treats the case of compact Calabian manifolds. So the statement is, well, so you first give me a Kähler manifold. Uh, so in particular, you specify the cohomology class of this symplectic form. Uh, and you also give me this nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So you should think of this as, well, a piece of cohomological data, the class of omega, and uh, a purely uh, algebraic, uh, algebra geometric piece of information, which is uh, this complex manifold with, with the holomorphic volume form. So the output of that theorem is to say that within this cohomology class of this symplectic form, uh, you can find a unique Kähler metric representing this class so that this equation is satisfied. And in particular, you get a solution of the vacuum Einstein's equation. So this is the famous work of Yao, which got him the Fields Medal, among many other reasons. Um, so 
The problem with um, this theorem is that it's quite abstract. Uh, it involves solving uh, a nonlinear PDE. Uh, and it doesn't quite tell you what the actual metrics look like uh, in typical situations. And in fact, almost all the compact examples uh, are non-explicit, uh, at least not completely explicit. Uh, so the only ex completely explicit complex, compact examples would be uh, essentially the tori, uh, the, the abelian varieties. So these would be flat examples. Uh, so the historical perspective is if you actually want to know what the metrics look like in concrete cases, maybe you have a better chance uh, with working with non-compact samples. And this would give you many more explicit uh, possibilities, which you can write down. Uh, so the moral somehow is that the non-compact samples are geometrically simpler, uh, at least in some cases, in the sense that you can actually write this down. Uh, but sometimes it's harder analytically because, well, non-compact samples are usually, uh, well, you, you have to deal with the infinity uh, at some point. Um, so, however, for the purpose of this talk, um, we take a slightly different viewpoint um, and somehow the key points to take away uh, message is that the non-compact samples really should be understood as the building blocks of the compact examples, uh, especially when we study the compact samples near certain degenerate limits. So what does that typically mean? So if you're familiar with some uh, differential geometry, then uh, there is a common thing which, which people do in this field called gluing constructions. So if you have uh, more basic objects, you can build more complicated objects out of them by some kind of implicit function theorem argument. Um, so this is roughly what it means to, to be a building block. Um, but somehow uh, in this talk, we take the perspective further that, uh, okay, so in usual gluing problems, you already understand the building blocks very well and you try to construct new, uh, more complicated examples. But uh, today we sort of reverse this viewpoint. Uh, so by thinking about what the more complicated compact examples might be, uh, we can actually motivate the construction of these building blocks. So this is taking a reverse viewpoint of essentially the same uh, underlying principle. So let me tell you some explicit examples of Calabia metrics. So these are really meant to be basic. And so, well, of course, the uh, number zero example would be the Euclidean space and a flat Euclidean space with, uh, let's say, CN, with the standard complex structure and standard uh, metric. That, that would be, of course, the solution of this labial condition. Uh, so the, if you want to get uh, at least one non-trivial example, maybe the first one you write down would be something called the Iguchi Hansen matrix. So this admits plenty of descriptions, but uh, I will take this description for the purpose of today, which is going to be quite convenient later. Uh, so the underlying manifold from this perspective is an affine quadric inside C3, defined by this equation. You have three variables. Uh, you, uh, you ask this thing to be equal to a constant, uh, and that uh, gives you a two-dimensional uh, complex surface. So to write down a Kähler metric, what you can do is to write down a Kähler potential. Uh, and the metric is going to just be given by uh, I partial partial bar of this potential. So this is the way these two things are related. So I just have to give you one function in order to specify a metric, which is one of the nice things about Kähler geometry. Uh, so in this explicit example, you, your Kähler potential is actually really simple. So this is the explicit formula. This H is the sum of modulus squared. So Y is the sort of defining parameter of, of this quadric. So this specifies a metric, and you can check this is actually a Clavier metric. So of course, um, these examples for different y's are just related by scaling. 
So the basic features of this particular example called the Gucci Hansen matrix is that its asymptote at infinity is C2 over Z2. Uh, well, so with the flat orbifold metric. So the way you can understand this statement is by first thinking about what this construction means for y equal to zero. And uh, you can probably believe that uh, for a fixed y, as your z goes to infinity, uh, around infinity, the feature of y becomes uh, essentially negligible. Uh, so the asymptote at infinity is essentially determined by what happens for y equal to zero. And then what you get is just the affine, uh, Affine comb, quadric comb, uh, and uh, it's quite well known to be the same thing as C2 over Z2. And uh, by checking the formula, which is not very complicated, uh, you convince yourself that this is actually a flat orbital metric. So, in particular, um, if you take the volume of the geodesic balls with radius r, that grows as r to the fourth power. So here, the real dimension of this manifold is four because the complex dimension is two. Uh, and the way you sort of see this, um, well, the growth of the volume depends only on the behavior near infinity because this is an asymptotic statement. So what happens with this case is the same as what happens for the Gucci Hansen case. Um, and from this, you easily see that this, this is the case. So this is called the maximal volume growth in a sense that if you give me any VC flat manifold um, and you compute uh, the volume divided by the radius to the, the power of the real dimension, um, so that, that quantity is uh, actually monotone, uh, decreasing. So what that implies is that um, the volume of the geodesic balls uh, in this kind of very general context can only grow uh, at most as the radius to the real dimension. So to saturate this is called maximum. So the Gucci Hansen metric is also highly symmetric. So in particular, it's symmetric under SO3R. Uh, well, you just check that these defining functions. Well, the, the, the reason you, you see SO is because this is an up and come. Uh, well, you also have a metric structure. So compatible one with the SO3. Well, this example also generalizes to higher dimensional quadrics, uh, and those generalizations are known as tensor metrics. I won't bother you with the explicit formula. Uh, I mean, it's, it can be written down, but it's more complicated. So the second uh, basic example of uh, Calabria metrics is something called the top dot metric. So this is uh, something living on complex two dimensions. And uh, the easiest way to write such a thing is in terms of something called the Gibbons Hawking ansatz. So, what does that roughly mean? So, you have a Calabria twofold. So, the real dimension is four. You have a circle symmetry. Um, so, sometimes acting with uh, fixed points. Uh, so in particular, you get a sort of S1 bundle away from some singular points. And uh, there is this gibbons Hawking ansatz, which tells you how to reconstruct the Calabria metric uh, by looking at, well, basically the data on the three-dimensional base you obtain by this S1 quotient. Um, so on this base, there are distinguished coordinates given by the moment maps of, uh, well, the, the, the three uh, compatible symplectic structures. So, uh, so, so we are talking about hyperkähler manifold. So you have some distinguished coordinates. And this V is just a, a positive real valued uh, function on the base, which is related to the length of uh, the circles. So the top dot metric can be written down in this explicit ansatz um, as follows, where this A is uh, a parameter uh, greater or equal to zero. 
So if A is equal to zero, this just reproduces the flat uh, C2 example. Uh, so in particular, you can see that, uh, well, this whole formula describes just topologically the manifold C2. Because when you vary A, what happens is you are changing the metric, but you are not changing the underlying manifold. So when A is greater than zero, then the asymptotic geometry would change quite drastically. So instead of the flat C2, what you have is an S1 bundle over um, R3 uh, minus uh, uh, over R three minus a compact region, so this is what happens near infinity. So if you delete the area uh, where uh, well this function gets very large, so in other words, you you consider going out to infinity when when this x i s go go to infinity. Um, so what you have is well you have the circle bundle, so this theta is the connection. And V tends to a constant, which determines the circle length. And you have uh, three other directions, which are unconstrained and which are allowed to sort of grow. So in particular, you see that the volume of the geodesic balls grows like the radius to the third power, not to the fourth power. So the reason here is because, well, the circle direction uh, converges to a fixed length. So one dimension is sort of wrapped up, if you like. Uh, and the other thing you see is that the tangent cone at infinity, which is like the coarsest description of what happens asymptotically, uh, is going to be given by R3. So this you can see from well having these three directions. So it's a somewhat non-trivial fact observed by Lebrun uh, that this example is actually biholomorphic to C2, not just topologically equivalent to C2, uh, with the standard holomorphic structure. Uh, so in some other complex coordinates, you can write this in, uh, in terms of that. But this is not completely obvious. So the way you should really understand these two examples is that the Gucci Hansen metric is the prototype of maximal volume growth, uh, and it models non-collapsing degenerations. So uh, a typical scenario where this thing appears is if you have a Kuma K3 surface, uh, kind of, and in certain uh, small regions inside this. Uh, you will see the Gucci Hansen metrics appearing as bubbles. So the top part metric, on the other hand, uh, has uh, non-maximal volume growth, as you saw before. So this is third power instead of fourth power. And what this models is collapsing behavior. So for, for instance, this is supposed to be important in the SYZ vibrations. Uh, so if you're aware of related works, for example, you can think of the paper of Rosen Wilson. Uh, so if you don't understand what um, collapsing and non-collapsing means, so here is a, a rough sort of way of imagining what this roughly means. Uh, so if you have a non-collapsing uh, manifold, um, what, what this means is that if you take the, the volume of, of this global manifold, uh, if you renormalize the, the diameter to be of order one, the, the volume is a state of, of size one, uh, roughly, of that, that order. So in that case, you call this thing is non-collapsing and collapsing if otherwise. So a typical sort of picture you should imagine is if you take a rectangle uh, with, let's say, uh, the length equal to one, uh, so if the, your width is roughly of order one, this picture is non-collapsed. But if the width kind of shrinks down to almost zero size, then, then this picture is said to be collapsed. Uh, and when collapsing happens, typically speaking, you, your geometric limit uh, will be a lower dimensional object. So this is the kind of general picture you should have in your mind. So 
maybe as a bold, a somewhat bold claim, uh, if you truly understand these two examples, you probably already know 70% of the geometric aspects of non-compact Calabian metrics. Uh, so this is the geometric aspect, the analytic issues being a somewhat different matter. Uh, what, what I mean here is roughly speaking that uh, most of the interesting phenomena you see in more general examples are already visible in these two. So historically, people focused on explicit constructions of non-compact labials, like the two examples I showed you. So what Tian Yao uh, introduced is a more analytic perspective. And the moral of their work is that if you can prescribe the asymptote at infinity by some ansatz, which is Calabial, up to sufficiently fast decaying errors. So remember that this manifold is non-compact, so you always have to talk about the infinity. So the point is that you need an ansatz uh, which almost solves the Calabial equation outside some kind of compact region. And this solution is meant to be kind of better and better approximating the Calabial conditions as you go further and further into infinity. Uh, and the approximation has to be good enough somehow. So if you have that, uh, and if you have some kind of very basic estimates on, on your manifolds, such as some kind of weighted Sobolev inequalities, then you can make a Calabial metric by sort of what you should imagine as perturbing this metric. Um, so this uh, perturbation is meant to be small near infinity, but, but inside a compact region, this is not a small perturbation. So this is a genuinely nonlinear result. So some of the sample applications of their package is, uh, so suppose you take a, a final manifold, you take away a smooth anti-canonical divisor. So the complement will be a Calabial manifold and there's actually a way of getting a Calabial matrix on such a thing. So the Tian Yao original work is in the 90s, um, and since then people have cleared up the package, and maybe the best useful package is in Hayo Hain's thesis. So the fundamental question in this subject is to what extent is the complete non-compact Calabial metric unique? So you have plenty of solutions given by those constructions, usually of highly analytic nature, but you have very little control on the uniqueness question. In fact. So what sort of data would parameterize such objects? So your naive expectation perhaps is that, um, well, if you're familiar with the compact case, uh, so in a compact case, what Yao's theorem tells you is that if you give me this complex structure with, with the homomorphic volume form, uh, and if you specify the cohomology class of this scalar form, then the metric is uniquely determined. So this is what happens in a compact case. So you naively might expect that this is also true in a non-compact case, so, but this is wildly false. Uh, so historically, people were quite surprised when Lebrun observed that the Taubnaut metric is actually biholomorphic to C2. So the Taubnaut being the one example I showed you before. So this was quite surprising because if you think about what C2 is, C2 has well the standard complex structure, uh, and the complex structure doesn't have any deformation, and there's also no topology associated to C2, at least naively. So you might expect that if the Kähler class is uh, something cohomological, then, uh, well, you don't have enough room to have a non-trivial metric. Uh, but this example tell, tells you that this is not quite the case. So historically, it seems like the significance of Lebrun's observation was not truly well understood. So for instance, people still believe that the exotic metrics exotic meaning metrics, Calabial metrics on, on CN, uh, which are complete uh, Calabial, but not, not Euclidean. Uh, so people believe that exotic metrics cannot exist under maximal volume growth condition. 
the maximum volume growth means the volume of GDC cores grows like R to the real dimension. So somehow, if you truly understand why the top notch example is there, then it's actually not so difficult to construct counter examples to, to this, which is the main topic I'm going to mention today. Uh, but people apparently didn't do that for at least 20 years. So which tells you that understanding the top notch metric is actually not that easy. So, so the spoiler somehow is that actually, although naively speaking, you don't think C2 has any topology, but the sort of topology which allows C2 to have such a metric actually comes from a, a holomorphic vibration structure. Well, taking a different perspective, uh, the, the topology requisite for constructing a non-trivial uh, metric comes from an S1 vibration over an almost flat base. So if you take either one of the perspective, that actually gives you a quite large possibility of uh, generalizations. So the first view um, is the main topic of this talk, uh, which leads to constructions of many complete non-compact and maximal volume growth examples. The second view suggests um, something called gravitational instantons. Uh, and in fact, high dimensional generalizations of those things, uh, for example, relevant in the SYZ vibration, etc. But, but that's not going to be the focus for today. So let's sort of change the topic and uh, talk about compact examples. Uh, so really the motivation of my work comes from studying collapsing Calabial threefolds with a Lifshitz K3 vibration. So you have a Calabial threefold. Um, so this is complex three-dimensional. You have a vibration structure onto P1. The fibers are, the generic fiber is a K3 surface. Uh, so the Lifshitz condition means that the singularities in the vibration looks locally looks like this. Uh, so this is just a quadric. Uh, expression. So by saying that you want to study a family of collapsing metrics, what I mean is that you're changing the Kähler class. So you take a, a fixed Kähler class on the threefold, you uh, take the standard class on, on P1, you pull back this thing, so that gives you another class on the threefold and you introduce a small parameter t. So by taking this linear combination, you get a family of Kähler classes. So Yao theorem would abstractly give you a family of Calabial metrics. And the question is in understanding what those metrics actually do, uh, especially what happens around the origin. So it's not very hard to see that this family of metrics will in fact be collapsing. Um, the way you sort of imagine this, it's, it's not very hard to believe at least, and actually not so hard to prove uh, that this family of metrics um, would kind of converge to something on CP1. And the, with a very naive way you, you sort of see this is, well, the formal limit as T goes to zero, well, this, this term vanishes. So the class becomes something pulled back from CP1. So the fibers should disappear. So the, the family of metrics had better converge to something lower dimensional. And as I said, this is a typical picture of collapsing. So somehow, um, um, so previously, um, it was sort of quite well understood what happens uh, on a very large scale. So at, on, on the scale where uh, you, you sort of scale the metric to have roughly diameter of order one, what happens is that everything collapses down to a, a metric on CP1. And if you sort of scale everything so that the fibers have uh, roughly a diameter of order one, then what happens is that the metrics converge to K3 times C, 
So what you are seeing is not the entire manifold uh, in that case, but rather the neighborhood of the case three fibers. But what happens uh, near the origin, uh, by, by which I mean near the, the critical points of this vibration, uh, is something happening at an even smaller scale. And you don't quite uh, naively get this by looking at the easiest possibilities. So by thinking about this problem, some of the local behaviors can actually be predicted. So what you can predict a priori is that a tubular neighborhood around a singular fiber should be volume non-collapsing, uh, morally because what happens around a singular fiber had better be k3 times c. And uh, if you take a, a ball of roughly the same size as the k3 fibers, then that, uh, in that scale, uh, the volume divided by the radius to, to the real dimension is sort of bounded below. So even though the manifold is collapsing globally, uh, locally speaking, it's not quite. Uh, so the second feature you can sort of predict is that the Gucci Hansen matrix should model the vertical directions of the metric. So here you have a vibration structure. So you have uh, the vertical fiber directions and you have the horizontal directions. So the horizontal direction, roughly speaking, comes from uh, the map to C and the, the vertical directions uh, come from, well, the, the, the quadrics. So just think about this quadratic function. So the horizontal direction um, should be controlled by the Euclidean metric pulled back from uh, this holomorphic function. So that's roughly what models the horizontal direction, uh, at least away from a very tiny ball near the origin. So independent of the motivation um, from this compact uh, collapsing problem, what we can expect a priori is to get a non-trivial Clabial metric on C3 uh, with maximum volume growth. So, and there are precise predictions on the asymptotes of this metric um, to ensure that it can be glued into X. So basically, if you want to predict the, the, the metric model, uh, the, the way you, you sort of do this is by thinking about how, how this region might fit into the global picture. Uh, and if you do this, you will get some kind of guess about what the, the, mo the model had better look like. Uh, and in, in our case, this actually uh, gives you enough hints to reconstruct the, the model um, just based on this kind of a priori guess. And so too much about words. Uh, so in terms of concrete formula, what, what you expect is that the, the local metric had better roughly look like this. So just to help you to understand what these terms roughly mean. So this F is a quadratic function uh, coming from the vibration structure. So this term gives you the Euclidean metric pulled back from the base. So this T is the degeneration parameter. Uh, so this square root expression, if you still remember, that comes from the uh, the Kähler potential of the Gucci Hansen matrix. So this T times this uh, is coming from, well, basically the the description of the Gucci Hansen matrix on, on the fibers um, kind of multiplied by the degeneration parameter. And so this roughly gives you the, the guess for the Kähler potential up to some kind of approximation. And the way you get the Kähler metric out of the potential is by taking I partial partial bar. So this is your guess about what the local metric had better look like. So in fact, if you rescale both the metric and the coordinate variables, then this formula uh, is actually 
up to uh, rescaling equivalent to uh, the formula without the T parameter. So the T parameter would actually disappear if you just make some changes of coordinates, uh, some linear change of coordinates. So just to summarize, um, this problem of studying the collapsing problem uh, would allow you to predict uh, a metric on C3 with this kind of asymptotic formula near infinity. So if you didn't exactly follow uh, the collapsing problem, then this is basically the output. So the problem with this expression is that it's not quite regular. So actually what you need to do is to regularize uh, this expression first. So by this- Yang I apologize, sorry. So in, the, in this metric on, on, on C3, is there any uh, part of the metric that looks like a Gucci Hansen cross C? Uh, yes. Uh, so, I mean- So the, in geometric terms, so if you take, a, I don't know, a point, sequence of points going to infinity, and then if you translate that to go to the origin, do you get a Gucci Hansen cross C or something like that? Well, actually, you get a, a whole continuum of Iguchi Hansen times C uh, with, with the uh, scale of the Iguchi Hansen going to infinity quite slowly. Uh, so, right. So, well, so, okay. So, the, the way you should understand this metric uh, asymptotes is that you, you have this C factor always, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, roughly speaking, near yeah, every uh, every quad, uh, quadric fiber, you have the Gucci Hansen. But the Gucci Hansen also depends on the, the parameter which specifies which fiber you are on. Okay? So you actually get a, a family of Gucci Hansen times Cs, depending on uh, which, well, basically, which, which Gucci Hansen fiber you are talking about. So as you go to infinity, uh, the kind of the characteristic scale of the Gucci Hansen's also goes, goes to infinity. But the rate at which this scale goes to infinity is sort of, uh, it's sublinear compared to the distance to the origin. Okay, so this expression of the metric is not regular because what happens around the singular fiber is, uh, well, so, so this F modulus is, is not quite a smooth expression uh, when F is equal to zero. So this is a slightly cheating way of writing the formula. So the actual answers I use is a little bit more complicated, but this is the impressionistic kind of feature, you, uh, impressionistic answers you should just imagine. So what are the basic features of this ansatz? Well, so first of all, it has quite a lot of symmetries. So you have the SO3 symmetry. Well, the, the reason you have SO3 is because, well, everything is attached to a, let's say, a, a quadratic function. And uh, you also have some kind of, uh, you also have this H, which specifies a Hermitian metric. So you should have this SO3. So the U1 comes from rotating uh, basically the face of F. So this is quite a lot of symmetry, so which is kind of like a co-dimension two symmetry. And also near infinity in the vertical directions, this is roughly speaking the Iguchi Hansen metric. Uh, in fact, you have a family of Iguchi Hansen metrics, not, not just one. Uh, and in the horizontal direction, you get this Euclidean metric. So in particular, um, if you take the tangent cone at infinity, which is like looking at the geometry in the coarsest terms, um, so what this means is you fix the origin and you scale down the metric by uh, larger and larger factors and you take the 
cause this sort of metric limit, then what you should get is C2 over Z2 times C. So how, how should you think about why, why this comes about? Well, you always have the C factor coming from the map to C. So everything, so we are talking about a map from C3 to C, just given by the standard quadratic function. So you always have this C factor. And the C2 of, over Z2 comes from the asymptote of the gucci hansen matrix. So remember that the asymptotic behavior of the gucci hansen is given by C2 over Z2 with the flat orbifold metric. So basically, if you go in vertical directions to infinity along any fixed gucci hansen fiber, you will see this C2 over Z2 factor. And in a horizontal direction, you will have this C factor. So you would get C2 over Z2 as the tangent cone at infinity. Uh, but as Andre asked uh, a while ago, uh, the, the sort of true picture uh, involves a little bit more nuance, um, kind of like uh, in a sort of slightly non-generic regions near infinity. So if you don't fix your point at the origin and, and do the scaling there, and instead you allow your sort of central points to move to infinity along the gucci hansen fibers, and uh, you sort of scale everything by appropriate scales, then you can also get a gucci hansen times C as a kind of scaling limit. So the sort of asymptotic description of the manifold near infinity uh, entails that the metric has maximal volume growth. Well, the sort of easiest way to convince yourself why that might be the case is, well, the, the sort of closest approximation of the metric is just C2 over Z2 times C. So this gives you four kind of dimensions of growth and this C gives you uh, another two dimensions of growth. So altogether, this is maximal volume growth. So what you can check is that um, the regularized version of this ansatz uh, gives you an almost Calabia metric uh, uh, with the approximation getting better and better near infinity. So if you, if you look at a compact region, this is not going to be any approximation of a Calabia metric, but if you go near to infinity enough, then um, this is approximately Calabia. But the approximation rate is actually not fast enough to directly apply any previous package. Uh, so these analytic constructions require not just having an approximation, but actually approximation with sufficiently fast decay. So in order to sort of reduce to situations which I studied before, I have to perform a preliminary stage where one solves some kind of auxiliary ODEs uh, to correct the error by hand. So first try to improve the approximation near infinity to a sufficiently fast uh, rate. And then, uh, and then one can apply these analytic packages of the Tian Yao type to basically get a Calabial matrix after sort of some kind of non-compact version of Yao zero. So the output of this discussion is that you have constructed a complete Calabial metric on C3 with maximal volume growth uh, and with tangent cone uh, C2 over Z2 times C uh, and with asymptotic behavior roughly of this type uh, whose basic feature is that you have the C direction controlling the horizontal behavior and you have the Gucci Hansen controlling the vertical behavior. So this would be the output of this construction. And it in, in particular tells you that if you just have a Calabria metric with maximum volume growth on C3, it does not need to be the flat Euclidean metric. So this in particular falsifies some previous conjectures on this subject. 
So some of the later developments in this area, I should mention a few. Uh, so uh, Roland Colon and Frederick Richon, um, and independently, uh, Gabo Sakihidi developed some more elaborate linear analysis precisely to tackle the problem of uh, improving the approximation rate at near infinity. So what this allows them to do is that they get uh, a much larger supply of exotic Clavier metrics on CN associated to other vibrations uh, from CN to C, not just uh, this, this simple-minded quadratic function, but you can take many other polynomials as well. So in particular, you can take the Lefschetz vibration in any dimension higher than three. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the original motivation for constructing this metric is, in fact, in studying the collapsing problems on Clavier threefolds with K3 Lefschetz vibrations. And this motivation turns out to be valid. So this exotic C3 metric uh, turns out to be the blow-up limit of uh, the collapsing metrics on the, these compact threefolds uh, under some very fine-tuned scaling procedures. So the way you show this is by some kind of gluing construction. So later, Gabo also showed some kind of geometric uniqueness result for this exotic C3. So what he showed is that if you assume the tangent cone at infinity is, is this given one, uh, then this complete Calabial metric in fact has to be the, the same as this, this particular metric I mentioned. Um, and also, there are, in fact, many more exotic metrics on C3 um, outside of the maximal volume growth world. And uh, the behaviors of those metrics are more analogous to the gravitational instantons. And those had better be relevant for uh, the SYZ conjecture, etc. But that, that's obviously too much for one talk. So let me try to wrap up by explaining a little bit more about how kind of with hindsight, how you might understand the Bruce observation that the top dot metric in fact gives you something biholomorphic to C2. So that example was the first example which told you that if you have a Calabian metric on C2, you don't actually have to be the flat Euclidean metric. So how should you understand that? So the answer is that this is the metric you get by looking at the simplest possible vibration from C2 to C. And that vibration is just going to be given by Z1, Z2. So this quad, uh, quadratic function. Um, so just kind of by pure analogy, let's try to imagine what the sort of resulting metric should look like. Well, uh, by the sort of general principle of the construction I described earlier, you expect to have the horizontal direction modeled on C, and you expect the vertical directions to be modeled on basically the Clavier metrics on the fibers. So what are the fibers in this extremely ex simple example? Well, so if you have Z1, Z2 equal to a constant, that, that specifies the fiber of this vibration. So these fibers are just C star, uh, so also known as cylinders. Uh, and on cylinders, you have Calabial metrics, which are just kind of Euclidean metrics. But the, the difference between uh, cylinders and uh, kind of CN with the Euclidean metric is that the cylinders have one direction wrapped up into a circle. So the result of that is, if you look at the, the flat metric on C star, um, the volume growth of that metric only grows uh, in one direction, but not in a circle direction. So this results in the fact that um, the resulting metric on C2 
which has one uh, direction of growth in uh, the fiber direction and two real dimensions of growth in the base direction. So the altogether volume growth has kind of cubic dependence on the radius instead of uh, fourth order. So this explains the fact that the top dot metric in fact only has cubic volume growth, not, not fourth order growth. So maybe for the future, that let me just mention what are the sort of major problems of uh, this field as I see it. So first of all, um, the general question about uniqueness and moduli questions are very far from being settled. So following the construction of uh, Colin Rochon and uh, Sakhidi, now you get a very plentiful supply of Galapian metrics on CN uh, with maximum volume growth, and which are complete. Uh, so these are attached to many uh, weighted homogeneous polynomials, giving you those vibration maps. So a natural question is to what extent uh, these metrics uh, parameterized by, uh, for instance, these vibration map structures, or maybe some more exotic structures, so how should you understand those objects algebraically? So at the moment, we don't have a very thorough picture of this. The only main sort of result is this result of Gabo telling you that uh, in the simplest case, um, the information of the tangent cone could actually recover the metric. But in general, we don't uh, have a very good picture of this. Uh, so another sort of direction one could go is if you abandon the maximum volume growth restriction, then you would encounter an even larger kind of uncharted water. And uh, you could ask what might happen there. So um, I would personally think that to answer fully that question, it seems to be far beyond reach, but maybe one could at least impose more restrictions on, on the sort of asymptotic behavior and ask about what might happen in more specific cases. So for instance, uh, what would happen if you, for example, assume that the tangent cone at infinity is some lower dimensional Euclidean space. So even in that case, uh, it seems to be very widely open. And uh, so this is, roughly what I mean by the high dimensional gravitational instantons. So you had better have bounded curvature and curvature sort of decaying faster than quadratically near infinity in the generic direction. So if you impose those, you might hope to get a better theory. Um, but at the moment, this remains widely open. Um, so I should probably finish here with leaving you these two problems as the food for thought. Um, okay, thanks for your attention.